That's good. Turn to the book of Ephesians with me this morning, please. Chapter number 6 and verse number 12. Let's go to verse number 10. We'll start reading there. Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, in high places, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Father, I pray now that you'd anoint this holy word. Father, send it forth for the purpose that you intend it. It will not return unto you void, but will accomplish that which you please. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. The Apostle Paul includes whole armor of God at the beginning of the statement and then the whole armor of God finishes it. And he wraps up verse number 12 in between two declarations about the whole armor of God. Now, it's, doesn't, some folks don't like the idea, but the fact of the matter is that we are in a battle. We're in a war. And uh, it's, uh, it's not something that we necessarily choose. I'm not a warmonger. I'd like to see peace on this earth. But uh, you're not going to see it until the Lord Jesus comes back. But we are in a war, and we need armor, and we need weapons, and we need to understand the nature of our enemy, and we, un we need to understand the forces that are arrayed against us. And we need, uh, in this army, we have captains, we have lieutenants, we have sergeants, and we have general officers. Therefore, we need to be able to understand what we are up against. In the book of Ephesians, chapter number 6, the Apostle Paul makes it plain. He uses four terms. He talks about principalities. He talks about powers. He talks about the rulers of the darkness of this world. And then he talks about spiritual wickedness in high places. This uh, material that I'm going to give you this morning is in the opinion of a man. But I think I uh, pretty well agree with most of what he says. His name is Michael Hoggard. And I'm going to read what he says to you about principalities. He says, these devils work to control the realms of governmental authority. It's the prince of the kingdom of Persia, Daniel 10, 13. The prince of Tyrus, Ezekiel 28, 2. And the king of the bottomless pit, Revelation 9, 11. Each one represent a general area of authority that they have. The principality, therefore, is from the Greek word arche. It means the origin, the origin the ruler over, the one who has this absolute authority and power over a lesser power beneath him. So the apostle puts it first and says, these are principalities. Then he mentions powers. The second group, powers. These devils represent giving mankind the ability to perform outside of the boundaries of the three-dimensional world we live in. These are the evil angels responsible for, in, for inspiring the writings of J.R. Tolkien, The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter series, and Stephanie Meyer, The Twilight series. As fourth dimensional creatures, they have the power and ability in this world to appear and disappear at will, move objects with no visible force, fly, hover, float from one location to the next at will, and make considerable changes to the weather patterns of this earth, such as the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, Ephesians chapter number 2. The third group mentioned here, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Notice the apostle makes a clear delineation between one and the other. The rulers of the darkness of, the world, of this world, these are the lesser lights, that rule over the night, Genesis 1. These are responsible for keeping men in darkness rather than allowing them to see the greater light that rules over the day, our Lord Jesus Christ. They keep mankind in darkness and thus in fear. For man has always been fearful of darkness and of what he could not see. Devilish characters from legend and folklore, such as werewolves, vampires, ghosts, and witches. 
is. Are all beings who love the darkness rather than the light, similar to the way certain animals, beasts, are nocturnal in their nature? These beasts rule over realms such as rock and roll music, which is sometimes very dark, and horror films, which are almost always filmed in darkness. They are also the spirits behind secret societies, mystery religions, pagan and new age practices and beliefs. Those who are involved in these religions are in constant search of light instead of a system of beliefs that seeks to further conceal the light of the gospel of Christ. These people are looking for a light they are for an illumination. Yes, they are. But what they are finding is darkness and not light. There is only one light, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That's a twofold understanding. Comprehend in the sense they can never see it. Comprehend in the sense that they can never understand. They do not know what motivates you today. If you are a born-again believer, the light of Christ is what motivates you. Now I see clearly. Before I was in darkness, I can see now. The fourth and final group are the spirits involved with the instigators of spiritual wickedness in high places. One need not attend the Bohemian Grove ceremony, the Bilderberg meeting, or the inner chambers of the Illuminati themselves to know and understand that the closer you get to the top, the more wickedness would be evident. Amen, amen, and amen. When you get into these secret societies, as you rise in the ranks, you become more culpable because you understand more and you yield more of your soul and you receive more of the spirit that animates that group and the, and the time will finally come when you will receive knowingly the spirit of Lucifer himself and you become a Luciferian and a worshiper of Satan. This would include the top of corporations, political realms, financial institutions, religious denominations, including some so-called Christian, and practically every other realm that exists in the world. These four groups of devils represent the fourth kingdom that will come, and when it does come, and it's coming, the Bible says will come in like a flood. You may not be aware of it this morning, but the floodgates have been opened. The floodgates are open. This nation and this world is in free fall. All morality, all spirituality, everything that we held true to our soul and to our spirit is now in question. You are considered a fanatic. You're considered a fool. You will be stigmatized. You will be labeled. And this world will turn against you. There are those praying for revival. I believe with all of my heart God may give us revival. But when that revival comes, it will come more than likely in a way that you never imagined. It will come when official persecution comes against the church of God. And God's people will be awakened from their darkness. God's people will be removed from their comfort. God's people will be told for once and for all that this world is not your home. And when that moment comes, a revival will move in the people of God. And I'd love to see that. I want to see that. Because we have had a taste of it here and a taste of it there. There is power in the blood of Christ. There is power in the preaching of the gospel. There is power in this book that I hold before you this morning. We are not dead. When you are dead, that is antithetical to everything that we profess to believe as Christians. We should be full of life. The life of the resurrected Son of God. Amen. Rush Dizdar, most of you have never heard of him, has a website titled Shutter, uh, uh, Shatter the Darkness. This man has remarkable ability to open up the dark world because of his experience as a officer of the law. He has been firsthand, he has seen what, the, what, the, what sin does to people and to homes. And so therefore, his website and this material that I've got to you for I have for you this morning is a product of his years of research and study into the world of darkness. And I want to give you what he has to say. Look at the book of Revelation, chapter number 16 and verse number 13. 
The book of Revelation is a remarkable book. The book of Revelation is a book that you need to spend, spend time in and pray as you read it. Because this is a book that begins to open up the future for us. Revelation chapter number 16 verse 13. The apostle said, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. We have the satanic trinity in Revelation 16, verse number 13. We have the satanic trinity. What is that, preacher? That is the counterpart to the holy trinity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The satanic trinity is the power that animates this world. The satanic trinity is what fills the children of unbelief. They are motivated. They are fed. Their life is associated with satanic trinity of the devil, the false prophet, the beast. In Revelation chapter number 16, verse 13, we have unclean spirits, yeah. demons, that are characterized by frogs. In the book of Exodus, we know that one of the gods of the Egyptians was a frog. And we do know that God sent a plague on the land of Egypt, and he used one of their gods to plague them, for frogs were everywhere. If you'll remember, thy, my friend, read Exodus and read that every single thing, every plague that God sent in the book of Exodus was a direct judgment of God on the gods of the Egyptians. That's what he told them. He said, I will execute judgment on the God of the Egyptians. And it's a remarkable thing because the Egyptians had thousands of gods, but all it took was the blood of one little lamb over the doorpost and lintel, and they could move out of that land and they could be saved. Hallelujah. The blood was a barrier that they could not cross. The blood opened the door and nobody could stop them. And the blood sealed them as servants of the Lord. Thanks be unto God for his blood. If it were not for the blood of Christ, we'd have no hope today. Now here's what Rush Dizdar says. He says that in this world, in the United States and all over this place, there are millions of people that are worshiping Satan in various forms in various ways. And they believe strongly in rituals. These rituals include drugs and sex and every kind of perversion you can imagine. They are very dedicated to their rituals because when they get in their rituals, they conjure up demons. They conjure up demons because that gives them power. They're not playing. It's not a joke. It's not game time. It's not trick or treat. It's a real world of satanic power. Remember and don't ever forget. When the Lord Jesus Christ was confronted by Satan, he said, all the kingdoms of this world, they're mine. And I can give them to whomsoever I will. If you will bow down and worship me, I will give you all of this. And he showed him the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Now, my friend, that was quite a thing. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he said, get thee hence, Satan. He hath no part in me, but it was not a vain boast. Satan can give you power. He can give you money. He can give you the things that men in this world scratch and claw and kill to get. Satan can give it to you, but it's temporal. It's here. It's now. And when he gives it to you, he will come payday and he will exact from you everything he demands because you sell your soul to Satan to get what you can have for a short period of time. One of the great gods of the earth just passed away. He was 91 years old. He left this world and went out into eternity. And now he stands before God. My friend, I'm no man's judge. All I can take care of is myself. There is no life outside of Christ. But I'll tell you this, if that man left this world without the Lord Jesus Christ, having lived the kind of life he lived, he is standing in judgment now. And you don't want to be where he is. Amen. You won't know part of it. Now I'm going to give you four of the rituals that they use and what they summon. This gives you an idea. This is a, this is a light into this satanic world. It shows you how serious they are about what they're doing because they're not playing games. The rituals that summon demons, number one. The summon, summon, summoning of demons is for the individual to receive that demon into themselves. They believe that by receiving that demon, they receive power. They receive authority. There may be an hierarchy that the 
apostle is talking about in Ephesians chapter number 6, in the spirit world itself where they can rise up in power and authority. We don't know. There's a lot of things that we don't know, but we do know this. We do know up the cross at Calvary. The Bible said the Lord Jesus Christ made a show of them openly. He triumphed over every one of them. And therefore, the cross is their doom. The cross is what separates them from us. They must answer to the authority of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what do you mean by that? I mean this. I mean in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I plead the blood that was shed at the cross upon the devil, upon his power, upon his lying, and upon his curses. They want demons. They think that by gaining a demon, it will purify their blood. It will make them totally and completely dedicated to Satan. You see, preacher, do people like that? Oh, yes, they do. They live. They're here. They're, some of them are in Knoxville, Tennessee. Asheville, North Carolina has been inundated, they say, with witches. I would love to find out from some pastor that lives in that area. Because I don't know many folks over in that area around Asheville. Asheville is a beautiful place right there in the mountain. Beautiful Asheville, North Carolina. But, they, but these demons, the, these witches that have come in there with these demons, I wonder if the churches in that area have begun to feel a spirit move in their church houses. I wonder what's happened around there since these, these demon-possessed witches have been placing their curses upon the churches around Asheville, North Carolina. You say, can something like that happen for you? You better believe it can. Follow on with me. Number two, rituals that summon demons, ultimately releasing them on coven members and in the new chosen ones. In plain words, to call upon this dark world to give power to someone else. You know how we lay hands on somebody? Do you know how the Bible says lay hands suddenly on no one? Do you know how that when we lay hands on somebody, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus for them to be healed? We pray for God to deliver them? The Bible says when we lay hands on somebody, it's about the anointing of God. I believe in that. I believe firmly in the anointing of God. But the difference is their spirit is the spirit of hell. My spirit is the Holy Ghost. I've told you the other day, it may sound ludicrous, but this is a fact. You're wasting your time to try to cast the Holy Ghost out of somebody. In order to cast a spirit out of somebody, you've got to call on a higher spirit. Are you listening? I know on the surface of it, it may, but think about what I'm saying to you. They may try to cast something upon you. They may try to cast a spirit into your life. And can they do it? The Bible said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They will, they will summon demons to put them on their chosen ones. Now, how many of you ever heard of Pandora's box? And when that box was opened, I don't know what they expected to get. But when they opened Pandora's box... All hell broke loose, for out of that box came all kinds of stuff that they had no control over whatsoever. And that's what's happening around us now. Witch rule number three, they summon demons to cloak their coven, their coven of dark works, their meeting places. They don't want law enforcement to find them. These demons, therefore, are able to cover, he says here, he says, there is the hands of glory ritual done in September. This can be used to gain powers, demons, to keep a shield of supernatural invisibility. Remember this, real Luciferianism and all of its dark activity is done mostly in the night and in deep secrecy. Coven work and even the demons love to go supernaturally unnoticed. The evil one comes at night. This spiritual warfare that we are in, therefore, is a warfare to the death. It's coming, they're coming after your life. They're coming after your spiritual life. And in order for them to do what they want to do, they want to remain in anonymity. In plain words, the real seekers of demonic power are not the showy crowd that's out here marching right in front of you. They want you to see them. 
The real seekers of demonic power are sometimes the presidents of banks, the governors of, 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 of states, mayors of cities, high-ranking officials that you would never imagine, and they are meeting in secret, and they are going about their rituals so that they might be able to receive a power, and then once they receive that power, to turn it on you and exercise this power and authority against you. Because number four, he says this. He says they summon demons so that they can be sent against their enemies. And this is the part that gets scary. They can be sent against their enemies. What's that mean, preacher? That means that they may summon a demon, they may conjure one up to send it to your home, to try to choke you to death spiritually, to try to destroy you in this life, to try to kill you. You say, well, I preach you. Why would somebody want to do that? Because if you are preaching the gospel, if you're living the truth, if you have the faith of Christ and the light shining the way it should be, they despise you. They hate you. The Bible says that you are the savior of death and to death to these people that don't know the Lord. And you are. If you are what you should be as a Christian, you are their enemy. These are not just uh, just uh, people that you know that, that that doesn't really matter. They you they you are their enemy, and being their enemy, they want to come and destroy you. How many of you in this house today have any idea that somebody might have placed a curse on you? Have any idea that some witches' coven or some group of, of of these people are right now trying to put a curse on Temple Baptist Church? Have you ever wondered we come in this house and sometimes there's a deadness over here? There's a deadness in this place, and then all of a sudden it breaks loose, and there's freedom. The power of the Holy Spirit breaks that bond. There's a war going on in here, folks. Listen, if we were meeting in here and having a bingo parlor, and we were coming in here for a dance hall or something like that, the devil doesn't care about that one whit. He doesn't care. You do whatever you want to. But when you come in here and get serious about praying, serious about preaching the Word of God, serious about living for the Lord, serious about what you believe and what you trust, then they will seek you out. Why do they do that, preacher? Because you have a spirit in you that is greater than their spirit, and they know it, and they've got to stop you with anything they can because they want complete control. I haven't done it yet, but it'd be quite interesting to find out all over this country, college towns. Knoxville is a college town. We've got the University of Tennessee sitting over here. We had over 100,000 people meet yesterday in a stadium. That's a bunch of people. It'd be interesting to find out as you go across the country, what kind of churches and what kind of an effect do you have around a huge college campus? Say, so why would it make any difference? Because the professors over here, most of them, not all of them, but the professors over here at this college are teaching people that the Bible is just a joke. So how they do that? They're teaching them Darwinism. They're teaching them comparative religions. They're teaching them things that undermine faith in the Word of God. And when they do that, that's going to affect the community around them. Yes, it will. And then number five, number five, rituals that summon demons so they can be sent into the air. Boy, what's that mean? I'll read it for you. I want to read it carefully. Listen to this. This is scary. The idea behind this is that the presence would have control over and oppress areas, cities. The believer in Christ desires that the power of the Holy Spirit manifest in an area. Amen. And revival prayer warriors call God's manifest presence in and over an area, an open heaven. I have been in revivals, he says, where it seems God's presence hangs in the air. I can think of one place, Burlington, North Carolina. The people that went to that revival told me that when they walked under that tent, that they could just feel something. That was wonderful. It was the presence of God. That's that air. It's the air above their head. It's the presence of God on the place. The anointing of the Holy Spirit coming down. They hate that. They hate that. With dark powers in the air, the goal is the opposite. Dark power manifesting in an area or a city seeks to suppress the church. 
foster crime and violence and cloak satanic activity so it won't be detected. In areas or cities where evil powers hang in the air, you can be sure you'll find evil rituals. The satanic procedures that open and in some cases keep open doorways, gateways for these powers is done by continuous ritual working. What's a doorway and a gateway? What's he talking about, preacher? In Revelation chapter number 9, the Bible says an angel, a strong angel, comes down from God out of heaven and he has the key to the bottomless pit. He comes to an exact location on this earth. And when he gets there, he opens up that pit and that creature comes up out of that pit. Not just anywhere, that pit right there at that spot. There are places on this earth that are definitely satanic and demon-possessed. There are portals into another dimension. In other words, a spiritual world. They're here. They're on this earth. People come from all over America to go to places out west, certain mountains, certain valleys, certain rivers, certain places. They go there because there is a spiritual, they say, I never imagined when I got here the vibes that I've picked up. I've read their testimony. I don't want any vibes. I want the Holy Ghost. <laughs> but if you don't know the Lord, if you are unsaved, let me tell you what's happening to you right now. If you don't know the Lord Jesus and the Holy Ghost is not in you, when you come in contact even with an evil spirit, it spins. It'll spin. It'll cause goosebumps to rise up. Because the spirit is vastly superior to the flesh. Are you listening? Even an evil spirit is a spirit being that if it touches you, you're going to feel it. You're going to know it. And you're going to realize that that thing is vastly superior to your flesh. Your flesh, when it comes to creation, is at the bottom of the rung. Your spirit, and that's what you are, you're a spirit being that has a soul. Your spirit is in the image of Almighty God is at the height or the top of the rung. The soul is in between spirit, flesh. Flesh can feed the soul. You become soulish. You're thinking about yourself. Your soul is all tied up in this world. You don't have any spiritual power in your life because the soul is being fed by the flesh. But if you let the spirit feed the soul, walk in communion and fellowship with the Lord. When you do that, your soul becomes spiritual then. And you have a hunger and a desire for spiritual things. Nothing can change that. Once you're born again, once you're born again, you cannot be unborn. Once you become a child of God by the new birth, from that moment on, your spirit, from that day on, he that is born of the spirit is spirit. He that is born of the flesh is flesh. That new birth is yours throughout eternity. I'm glad for that. We have churches coming up about us now. They're all over America. They're everywhere. I told our Sunday school class this morning about a bishop, a lesbian bishop, who said that our Lord Jesus Christ was a bigot. Digest that. She said that the second person of the Trinity was a bigot. Fifty years ago, she would have been drummed out of any town or any church in this country. Nobody would have been, had been seen around someone who said that. But that's what she said. Here is a witch doctor. A witch doctor. She claims that she can cure people of cancer by talking to demons and making pacts with Satan. Well, that can't happen. What are what all these rituals for? Remember what I told you? They come, they have this power. I was told decades ago about a woman in Mexico City. In Mexico City, they said that people would line up out there to come to her, and she would go through a ritual, and many, many, many of those people would be healed. And she won a lot of converts, not to the Lord, not to the Lord, not to the Lord, but to her pagan religion. Churches today, they have a very uncertain, or they say ambiguous handling of the truth. And plain words, not clear how they handle the truth. That's the way they are. They have a desire to be so inclusive and tolerant, there's virtually no sense of biblical discernment in terms of recognizing and labeling false belief, practices, or lifestyle. They have a quasi 
universalistic view of salvation. What does that mean, preacher? That means that they believe that eventually everybody's going to be saved. Everybody. They have a lack of a proper appreciation for biblical authority over and against personal experience or revelation. In plain words, what my experience tells me and what I feel is superior to the Bible, according to that. The Bible, folks, is superior to what I feel. If the book says it, the book's right, I'm wrong. The Bible is the absolute authority. Openness to pagan religious practices like Hindu yoga and incorporating them into the Christian life and Christian worship. The church of God should not have anything to do with yoga. A Hindu mystic said that yoga means yoke. If you've been in it, get out of it. Here's the way it works with God. And this is important. Please, please listen to what I'm saying. We all get messed up. And sometimes we get into the wrong thing. Sometimes we'll be listening to the wrong thing. And we do it out of ignorance. That's one thing. But when the Holy Spirit shows you the difference and you're presented with the truth and the light, from that moment on, God judges you according to what you do with that light, that truth. That's the way it is with yoga. That's the way it is with anything. If the Holy Spirit makes that clear to your soul, and you pray about it. <laughs> pray about it. He tells you that yoga has nothing to, there's nothing compatible with it in Christ. From that moment on, you're accountable to God because you, you can't plead ignorance. They openly question the relevance of key historical biblical doctrines such as the Trinity. They have an unbridled cynicism toward conservative evangelicalism and fundamentalism. That's me. A reading of scriptures heavily prejudiced towards a social gospel understanding. Little or no talk of evangelism or saving lost souls. And this is a good one. A salvation by osmosis. <laughs> In other words, where you hang out with us long enough, you're going to be one of us. Everything's going to be okay. And this was all written by one who used to be part of an emerging church movement. We had a young man come through here about a couple of years ago. I'll never forget him. He sat over here. He's a big tall boy. And he came and he said, Preacher, he said, let me tell you something. He said, I used to be a worship leader in an emerging church. He said, I can sing. So I was a leader and I was up in front of people all the time. He said, I was, I was a leader in an emerging church. He said, then I got saved. <laughs> And he said, I immediately left it. That's quite a telling thing. He got saved. He met God. And the first thing he did was come out of it. You say, no, these people are saved. Oh, yeah, many of them probably are saved. This is why the Lord says in Revelation, come out from among them, my people. Come out and be you separate. I believe you can find saved, saved people probably in most Christian denominations. I'm not up here to push Baptist to this morning. That's not what it's about. But I do believe this. I believe it's just like the light that God holds you accountable for. If you get saved in a denomination that's apostate, turn this back on God. The Holy Ghost lights up your soul and you see the truth. From that moment on, you're accountable to leave that place and go where God leads you to go. Somebody asked me the other day, say, Preacher, can a Catholic be saved? He can be saved just like a Mormon can be saved. Or a Baptist. Or a Jehovah's Witness. Or any of them. But if he's truly saved, he won't stay in it. He'll come out of it, he or she, and he'll find fellowship with God's people where the Holy Spirit is. And that's, that's the good thing. So what I preach to you this morning now, it kind of puts it... Puts the ball in your court. I told you the truth. This is a spiritual thing. What are you going to do with what you've heard? Are you going to come out from among them and be a separate, saith the Lord? Or are you going to stay there for whatever reason? And if you do, God will judge you. Father, in thy name we pray. I pray you bless your word now as it goes forth, the message. What we preached about. 
Give glory to God. And I bless you for it, Lord. You've been good to me. You've been good to me. In thy name we pray. The heads are bowed and eyes are closed, nobody looking. I feel there's a reason for preaching this this morning. Is there anybody in this house that'd like to raise your hand and say, Preacher, I want you to pray for me because God's beginning to open up to me. He's beginning to show me things that I didn't even see six months or a year ago. I'm beginning to see it now. That's the Holy Ghost turning the light on for you. God bless you. God bless you back here. God bless you over here. God bless you in the back. Over here. God bless you in the middle. About halfway back. God bless you over here. That's wonderful. That's something to rejoice over. Is when God begins to show you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's if we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. God's son cleanseth us from all sin. That's part of walking in the light. It's following the light you've got and not rebelling against it and going on with the Lord. If God's doing that for you, hallelujah, you're beginning to see. Thank the Lord. Because I can't do that. I can't open up your, I can't do that. I can preach the minister, the minister the word, but I cannot open up your soul to receive the truth. God alone can do that. All right, Father, I pray for those who raise their hand. I pray, Heavenly Father, for every soul in this house and for every need that we have. We are so dependent upon you, Lord. We need you, Lord. We need you. Our enemy is very dedicated, Father. These witches and these covens and these Illuminatis and these Satanists and these Luciferians and all of this stuff, they're dedicated, Father. They're fully dedicated to what they're doing. They're serious about it. I would that the church of God was nearly as serious about what we believe and who we are as they are. In thy name we pray. Amen. Let's stand up and sing. All-American Church Hymnal 376.